Hej och välkommen till Learn. 1500 läringshistorier fra de bästa framtidstänkarna och skaparna. På learn.tech kan du lytte, se eller läsa allt innehåll gratis, men registrera dig för att få tillgång till personaliserade läringstider, certifikater och mycket mer. Hello and uh, welcome to the Learn series with uh, BI on sustainability in uh, daily operations. Uh, in conversation with Caroline uh, Dale Ditlev Simonsen from BEI uh, and several guests, we discussed the most important drivers of sustainability across the environment, society and uh, management for all companies in uh, Norway. We have a very pragmatic and practical approach in these conversations and we try to talk about um, uh, actions action points that people can take with them to their daily operations after listening to these conversations. Our guest today is uh, Walter Stahel, uh, founder and director of the Product Life Institute, which was founded in uh, 1982 in uh, Geneva. So welcome, Walter, and welcome, Caroline. Good morning to both Good of morning. you. Good morning. <laughs> So um, I usually start these conversations by asking people to do a short introduction of themselves. We have seen that people listen better and learn better if they can imagine a real person in front of them. So uh, Caroline, very briefly, and then Walter, a little bit uh, longer, please tell us, who are you? Uh, well, starting with me, I'm uh, I'm professor in sustainability at BI and then uh, focusing a lot on circular economy. I've been working on this for a very very long time. I started recycling bottles when I was 12 years old, and that was kind of my uh, income um, at that point. And uh, and I've continued around the same track ever since. Uh, and uh, here I am now. And you, Walter, who are you? Yes, I am studied architecture and then went into research. I'm basically always tackling problems that don't seem to interest other people. And in 1973, we had an oil price crisis and we had unemployment. And so I said, why don't we substitute the one we have too much people and uh, save energy. So I did a study, it took me two years to find a sponsor for the Co European Commission, the potential for substituting manpower for energy. And this is 76, this is how I discovered the, the circular economy. Of course, it took about 10 years until anybody really took notice of it, but that's uh, quite normal because it was so far off mainstream economics. And since then, I've basically followed the same track, yes. Walter, uh, I'm going to let uh, Cecilia introduce you um, as a guest, as, as, as relates to her course. But I, I have to ask you um, a very basic question. So. So much of our economy is based on growth and so much of our regulation deals with value chains that are linear. So uh, I, I, I understand why it was so difficult for people to latch on to these basic concepts, the central concept of circularity, both in economy and in production. But um, is there somebody doing for economy or economical theory, what you are doing for, uh, let's say, uh, production, industry, and products? No, because economics is uh, still basically, or teaching is educating students to become active, creative members in the throughput economy, the linear economy how you can become an expert in the circular economy is uh, that's what i tell everybody on an individual basis enjoy the use of your belongings and take good care of them 
and this is also the way I live. I can give you the the house I, I I'm living in is from 1757. The my three cars are from two are from 1969, and one is only 20 20 years old. That's a, a youngster, but basically you have to live what you believe in to to make the apprentice apprenticeship of how things work what you can do what you can't do and uh, the reaction of people and i think that's why i encourage anybody if you have a broken coffee grinder or radio whatever don't throw it away try to repair it you may not be able to repair it but by failing you learn a lot of things about the, the radio and how you could design a better radio. So whatever you do, try to learn from what you wanted to throw away. And you're astonished how often you can actually repair it yourself. I think uh, that's a very good uh encouragement both to uh, the students in Caroline's course but also to anyone listening to this and uh, it is at the same time in sharp contrast to what uh, marketing is trying to encourage us to do in uh, most of a commercial uh, life with uh, you know being a better consumer by uh, building new needs and replacing anything you have at a regular basis but uh, let's get back to that I think Caroline would like to say something yeah, I, uh, as you hear, uh, uh, Walter has long experience, not only with the cars, but uh, working on the circular economy. And that's why I'm so happy that you uh, you were able to come here. Like you're known as a guru in the field of uh, circular economy and kind of a father of the whole concept. And you have written books or like the Bible of a circular economy, which is uh, uh, translated into 30 languages or something like that. Um, well, anyway, um, uh, this, uh, what you mentioned, uh, the economic growth is important or thrive, which I think is even more important, but the teaching part, learning for uh, people how to deal with sustainability. And uh, Walter, you mentioned uh, um, what uh, students are learning today and along like, Previously, business student only learned how to uh, sell, produce, sell, finance, production. And whereas now we have courses like this, circular economy, but we still have to uh, have some kind of way to make it profitable to think uh, sustainability and especially circular economy. And that's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. Uh. Well, the, the big difference is that the linear industrial economy manufacturing ends at the point of sale and the circular economy begins at the point of sale. So the circular economy is use focused. It's about optimizing the use. Now that means for industrial uh, partners, industrial actors, th uh, they have to learn to sell the use of goods. Manufacturing one thing is, is one thing, but if you double the service life of a product, you have the manufacturing volume and you have the waste volume. So it's obvious who is against the circular economy of extending service, service life of products. But of course, sustainable, sustainability means using less resources and using making better use of, of resources of products and preventing waste. So the if a manufacturer wants to profit from the longer service life of product, it's his products, he has to sell the use of products. And there are different ways to do that. Uh, products as a service, software as a service, or paper use for equipment or rental equipment um, powered by the hour of Rolls Royce or Caterpillar. So when you do this, you actually profit yourself from a longer life of the equipment. So 
you 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 make more money from selling the use than you would make from manufacturing and this is the difficult transition that uh, suddenly your knowledge and know-how of manufacturing becomes secondary to know how you can design products so that they almost live forever because that's where you get the profit so you and may this have goes to- uh, and this goes very much against uh, you know the old uh, way of thinking where you know you want actually people to replace their products so that they would be good consumers and i remember the story of henry ford uh, when he asked his people in the factory, is there any particular part of this car that lives much, much longer than the rest? And then he said, well, then we have to make that part a little bit weaker. Change, change it. Change it, right? Yeah. Well, the, the, the linear economy lives from what I call the bigger, better, faster, safer, greener syndrome, which is an incentive to change what you have. The circular performance economy lives from uh, upgrading technologically upgrading the products you have so that you you don't throw away the whole product but you only change the component where you have the real progress but then of course uh, it's only the component manufacturers that really benefit not the manufacturers of of cars or airplanes or whatever but airplanes is a typical the typical example because airplanes have a manufacturer's warranty of uh, 17 18 years which means that uh, nobody's going to change or, or throw away an aircraft well, as long as it's under manufacturer's warranty so the and the, the taxation follows the same thing. So the write-off period, depreciation period for aircraft is 15 years. The depreciation period for a car is three or four years. So the, 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 in, the important thing is the incentives have to encourage people keeping their products. And then you have to design, of course, for ease of, ease of maintenance, uh, profitable operation, but it's a system thinking and you basically want to develop system solutions in order to really reap the the benefits from the use phase. Caroline, can I just ask one more thing before we, uh, we go into your uh, list of questions? I think this idea of systems thinking and design uh, for the flexibility, we, we, can, we have actually quite a lot of similar ideas in programming and computer science, Uh, you know, when we build our systems, they become very quickly, very fragile. They become, if they're not built, you know, by uh, modular, flexible components that you have some very good uh, rules to replace, etc. But this idea hasn't seemed to have caught on to the way that you produce cars or clothes or... So we just uh, had another chat with a a lady that we discussed... uh, um fashion for example you know when you don't throw away clothes because they are used up you throw them away because somebody says you know you need to look different and if there was a way to you know do a little bit of work on this yourself um then 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 those clothes could live much longer yes right so this idea of component based production modularity uh, flexibility and even the idea of something called DevOps from the programming world, where the same person that develops is also responsible for the operations. Yes. Should we spread this more? Well, the, uh, the one thing is component standardization, of course, so that you can reuse, if you can't reuse the whole product, you can reuse uh, the components of the product. But in military, uh, products, they even go further. They distinguish between mission specific, mission critical components and other components. And mission critical components means that whatever happens to an aircraft or a tank, the, the specific mission it has must be guaranteed. 
if for example in a car that would mean that even if your abs or any other electronic airbag doesn't work anymore you must be able to continue driving your car for example you may have to take your friend to a hospital or something and then you don't care if your abs is working or not but all the modern cars they they will block the car if you cannot uh, if something is not working yeah so so um Walter, we uh, talked about systemic thinking. We talked about uh, reuse of components, uh, standardization. It's process improvements. I, Caroline, can you help us relate this to the models and, and you know the, the concepts that you use at your course? Well, we use the, the from linear to circular economy as a, the concept, like everybody does, but try to make it more practical, example based, and inspirational. And um, there's so much interesting and uh, things mentioned there. So I'll just uh, pick up when. Uh, 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 some of the examples you came with here and, and comments. And I will start with what you said about Ford, uh, Sylvia, because Ford was also one of the companies that started not making new models all the time, which are like they have pros and cons and they were making the car similar. And then you won't, don't want to change it. It's, uh, you will keep the car for a longer time. And you also asked us to be personal here. So I'll share that uh, I have a Tesla, which is eight years old. It looks like all other Tesla. So it's kind of just making it in the same way uh, uh, makes uh, makes people keep it for a longer time. And like you mentioned, Walter, planes. We don't care what kind of plane we're sitting in, if it's modern or not. We just want to get, get from A to B. Of course, it's comfortable if there is somewhere to charge in the in the plane. But apart from that, if you if you have uh, we what we need is usually um, um, a product or a, a result of what we do. So when you, like I said, uh, go with the plane, we just want to get from A to B. And there is also another um, uh, typical example is that uh, when you you want to have a hole, you don't want to buy a drill, but you want to have a hole. But you uh, need to buy the drill or preferably rent the drill in order to get the hole. So we have to think more about what we actually need, not uh, the product as such. So yeah, that's kind of the process. Mm. Yeah, but let, let's come back to what can what's in it for the industrial actors. And uh, if you look at money, because basically economics is about money, competition, innovation, the most profitable activity in the product life extension is the remanufacturing of key components. And in a vehicle with combustion engines, the, the wear and tear is the biggest on uh, the engine, diesel, diesel engines and equipment building construction equipment or trucks. And uh, Caterpillar was one of the first to look into this, that they are, and they discovered by doing it that the cost of a remanufactured engine cost to the client is 40% less than a new engine, the same quality. But the return on investment on the factory or the remanufacturing is five times the return on investment of the manufacturing plant. And that's for the manufacturer much more important. And then the second thing that Caterpillar learned, if you are, there were a lot of third party independent remanufacturers. So how do you get your engines back to you rather than to a local remanufacturer? And they realized that you don't give a discount for a remanufactured engine, but you buy back the broken engine up to 40%. If the, uh, if the engine comes with all the aggregates and that change that the, the, the owner of the broken engine didn't look at that as waste and just threw it in a container or something, but he put it on a 
on a pallet and send it back with everything to get the highest return. So the, the, it's, it's a demand and supply. You have to educate people that even a broken engine has a value and the, the more complete the engine is, the higher is the value. But it was a year long learning process by Caterpillar. How do you actually, how do you optimize the, the whole remanufacturing process? But uh, I, I have to ask you guys, so one thing is optimizing the process so Caterpillar can do it. But I think of uh, cheap producers and Apple and computers and, you know, they really don't want us to be going directly to their suppliers. And they, they don't want this value chain that they control to be uh, disrupted or fragmented or somehow rearranged. Right. So it's to a large extent about control over the value chain. Yes. No? Yes. But this is the this is not the circular economy. This is making money in with all the tricks. So for example, it uh, one of the tricks is if you use an Apple or an, another computer is the apps. Because if you mm. download an app, what you don't see is that up to 40% of the money that you pay for the app is actually going not to the, the chap who invented the app, but it's going to Google or, or Apple. Uh, and so this is uh, why the, the manufacturer wants to keep the control because a, a smart to produce a smartphone costs about $10 and you buy it for about $500. But most of that money goes to intermediaries, whereas afterwards the money during use for downloading apps, downloading anything, goes to whoever controls uh, the, the software. And you don't, as a, as a user, you don't even know who controls this stuff. And so this, there is a dishonesty in selling you a smartphone so you become the, the owner, but you actually don't have control over it. And that is why I think a lot of these platform economics and uh, economies and uh, in, uh, internet of things uh, are very dishonest because they should openly declare who is controlling. It's not you who are controlling your fridge or your car or whatever. What do, what do you think are the most uh, uh, interesting opportunities? You know, wh where could we start? Is there a particular industry? So you started talking about cars and uh, defense uh, equipment. Is, is, is there somewhere where we can start this circular way of both arranging the economy, but also the production process first? Well, in the production process, uh, the, the biggest, the, the high hanging fruit, but probably the most profitable one, is to innovate in circular energy, such as hydrogen and fuel cells, Hi, uh, circular chemistry, polymers that can be depolymerized and repolymerized endlessly, and circular metallurgy. And circular metallurgy, the main uh, challenge is green steel to produce zero carbon steel because any product that you buy either contains steel or is made on machines that are made of steel. So if you really want to get to a zero uh, carbon economy, you have to first produce uh, zero carbon steel and then uh, reusable, not recyclable, but reusable polymers, monomers, polymers, and and energy, zero uh, carbon energy. And uh, of course, green electricity, according to the International Energy Agency, are only three countries that have green electricity. That's Norway, Switzerland, and Iceland. 
Iceland is cheating because they use the geothermal volcanic heat and Norway and Switzerland use uh, hydro electricity, which is a bit harder to make. But um, it's interesting that green electricity is really one of the of the foundations of a circular economy or a sustainable Can I, can I just society. ask you, uh, uh, sorry, Caroline, I just have to ask very briefly if you could expand once more on these three things, because I think this is such a clear picture. So circular energy, you said hydrogen. Be hydrogen. And then you said polymers that are reusable for materials. And yes. for metallurgy, you said green steel. Uh, say, say once again, uh, you know, uh, why are they central and what exactly do they mean? Uh, energy, you cannot, you can hardly do anything without energy. And uh, I'm talking about manufactured products, not agriculture. So green energy, zero, zero carbon energy is essential to produce anything. Then the, the, the polymers is uh, and why hydrogen? Hydrogen can replace um, natural gas in steel making or glass making, and green electricity can replace uh, is necessary for re steel recycling. But but then the big problem is plastics and of course we shouldn't let plastics escape into the environment so we have to keep it in a in a closed loop and in a closed loop we want to reuse the materials the atoms and molecules so we have to be able to depolymerize the plastic and then reuse the monomer to to produce a new polymer there are a few so for example, nylon, PA6 or 66, there are a few old plastics that can be depolymerized and are depolymerized. But the big thing is the, the, the consumer product plastics. And there, a lot of research is going into that. And the, the third thing is metallurgy. The, the, yes, steel steel is really the key because you cannot produce if you cannot produce zero carbon steel you cannot produce zero carbon products because steel is used in almost every product or it, or otherwise in the machines to make these products so the and these are the the high hanging fruit it's not obvious in Sweden actually already has one steel mill that is producing zero carbon steel using hydrogen. Uh, but uh, the, its the solutions are not obvious. But on the other hand, if you find the solution, you can patent it and you get um, your money back for the research. But these are not, oh, these uh, challenges are not open to every small and medium some uh, enterprise because it needs a lot of hardware and a lot of r and d equipment to to find the solution caroline as regards to norway uh, hydrogen doesn't seem to be a very popular thing here we we work on many other things but not that and then um I, I, do, do, do you see? Do, can you can can we relate this somehow to to the way we organize our countries and apply this to the most important fruits? Then, if not the low hanging fruits for Norway, yeah, I think Norway is uh, focusing on uh, hydro power. Still, we have the problem with that uh, in the EU because EU thinks hydropower is damaging the nature. So, yeah, and nuclear energy is better, but that's another story. I really like what you're talking about, big things, uh, Walter. It's, we 
often think about the uh, um, uh, circular economy, as we discussed earlier, um, yogurt uh, cups and uh, plastic uh, uh, cups. But we also have to think, we have to think in the small and we also have to think big. And I think especially what you talk about, the uh, green steel is important. Like these things that we use a lot of or which uh, we definitely need. And I think also cement is very uh, interesting uh, material. Thinking about that, that actually emits, it's on the list of the biggest uh, CO2 uh, emitters uh, in our society, kind of along the lines of uh, um, uh, like gas and oil. And uh, that's the only kind of product which is uh, in that uh, in that kind of uh, um, uh, graph. But um, uh, and cement is so hard to recycle and and uh, reuse. So I wonder, do you have some kind of uh, quick or at least some uh, uh, not quick, but uh, um, but but approaches to cement? Uh, you talk about green steel, but how can we? What's an alternative to cement or a way of dealing with the cement? It's a greenwashing problem because yes. you. you Cement, uh, sorry, concrete is made of yep. marine sand, aggregate, and cement, mm -hmm. Portland cement, mm -hmm. and water. You can, the only thing you can recover is the aggregate. So we shouldn't talk about recycled concrete, we should talk about recycled aggregate. You cannot recover the cement, you cannot recover the water, you cannot recover the marine sand. So the, the best sustainable solution to deal with concrete structures is repair and uh, upgrade, reuse, mm -hmm. uh, because if you demolish it, then it's an illusion to think you can make out of broken mm -hmm. concrete, new concrete. But of course, the, the cement industry is, is looking for other ways and they for example, they think that if they use waste to heat the kilns, then that is sustainable. And one of the really nice things is the blades from windmills made of um, carbon, carbon fiber laminates. So burning these is sustainable because it's burning waste. But uh, we have to be very careful. The if you look at sustainable energies, then windmills, you cannot recycle or not reuse whatever uh, the molecules of, of the blades. Uh, windmills, offshore windmills, you will never pay to recover the foundation, which is 60% uh, of, the, of the material, would be much too expensive. Um, Photovoltaic, you cannot recover the, the really expensive materials. You can recover the aluminum and the glass, but that is not the, where the money is in photovoltaic. So the, the so-called renewable energies, the, the energy is renewable, the wind and the sun, but the product itself is not renewable. You cannot repair it, you cannot uh, recover the atoms and molecules. So the, the it's very difficult. Sustainability finally is a very uh, difficult game because, and of course we try to cheat ourselves by saying, uh, come back, let's come back to hydrogen. I think you are mistaken. Hydrogen, Norway is a major producer, producer of hydrogen because they just signed a, contract with Germany to supply liquid hyd hydrogen to Germany for, I think, 30 years or I can't remember. The, and the Hurtigrut and uh, coastal ferries from 2025 onwards have to use either hydrogen fuel cells or ba electric batteries. They can no longer use a combustion engine. So the, the it may be hidden or you don't talk about it, but uh, hydrogen is a, a, something that is looked in and even produced uh, in Norway because you have the comp 
competitive advantage of the fjords. Your water is normally very high up and the, the, the sea is at the bottom of the fjord. And so you can almost any waterfall can be, or any river can be transformed into a turbine. And of course, then you have the problem, you have a green electricity, but of course you have problems with nature. Again, you, you, cannot, you cannot do anything uh, without having to do a, a trade-off with nature. Otherwise, we stop manufacturing at all. We stop, mm. we go back to living in, uh, in the medieval, no, even before medieval times. We live with nature and would be one solution, mm. but uh, I, I, I just need to latch on to what you were just talking about because it's a really interesting um, uh, uh, position uh, you have with so much uh, data and so much insight in many, you know, production areas from energy to products um, and many things in between in materials. Um, and at the same time, trying to see the big picture. And I think your final comment about, you know, you have to understand it's a trade-off. And uh, I just heard uh, a lecture about uh, copper. Somebody is uh, planning to build a very green copper mine at the very far north of Norway. And there, there, there are reasons why they call it green, although it's difficult to follow. Uh, but the point is that, you know, if we are to reach our goals on electrification of the car um, fleet uh, by 2035 or by 2050, uh, we need to double the production of copper in the world. And, and, you know, until we can reuse the copper used in electric cars and in batteries and in many other places, we have a, a, an unsolvable problem problem so i think that or you know in norway we really don't like the onshore uh, windmills because they as you say uh, disrupt nature or you know we don't even talk about the the, the water um, hydropower plants but if we people are going to have a quality or a standard of living we have today either you know we have to consume less or we have to have more efficient processes for everything or we have to uh, accept that there will be trade-offs and we are still damaging nature in some way, no? Let's come back to the electric mobility. You just made a mistake because battery is one solution. The fuel cell hydrogen is the other solution. So the, the electric car is that the electric motor is the, is the thing, but how you produce the, the energy there, you have many more choices. There are also new batteries, not using rare elements. You probably heard that in Sweden, they just discovered a huge uh, deposit of rare earth elements because the rare, uh, rare earth elements are actually not rare. They are everywhere, but they are difficult to extract and it's very polluting to, to get them out. That's why we like to leave these things to China or Chile or wherever the pollution is uh, natural. We think it doesn't cost us anything. But uh, the, the, the sustainability is really finding a, a way forward for society that balances the ecologic, social and economic uh, needs. Because you have to distinguish between wants and needs. And uh, the third world lives on needs. We, in the industrialized world, we basically mix up. We think our needs are our wants. So if we have only three cars and the new cars come up, a new car comes out like an electric vehicle, then of course we need the new car. We don't, we have enough cars. I have three cars, so why should I buy a new car? So the, the, what, we, what we want, we have, to, we have to learn to say, okay, I renounce the new car because I don't need a new car. And if we all change now, we scrap all the uh, 
combustion, combustion engine cars and by electric vehicles, we possibly overlook that there are way, ways to produce thin fuels, to produce zero carbon fuels that will allow to continue using your, your uh, combustion engine without produ producing carbon. So we mix, again, we mix up zero carbon fuel and, and uh, com uh, combustion engines. Combust there's nothing wrong with the con combustion engine if we have a zero, zero carbon fuel. And the, unfortunately, in, in many political discussions, it's, it's always going this way. Until a year ago, zero carbon was the one thing. There was no discussion. Now, thanks to Putin and uh, his follies, uh, nobody talks about zero carbon anymore. Now it's security of electricity supply. And of course, the problem of food supplies. Uh, and uh, in many countries, they are subsidizing now heat and uh, electricity because people can no longer afford it. So the, we need, what we need is really a vision in politics and I think Norway, in that sense, has a relatively good vision, including the, the hydrogen economy. China, for example, has, China is the only country that has five pillars of their industrial um, strategy. One of these pillars is remanufacturing. So if you want to sell goods or produce goods in China, you also have to sell and produce remanufactured goods, even if you are a European company like Bosch. Now, this is accepted in China, but in Europe, we, uh, we don't want to do it. And in China, it's for strategic reasons, because to put it very blankly, if there is a war, you may no longer have access to a lot of imported resources but you have access to all the stocks of goods and materials in the country. And so remanufacturing is a uh, preventive uh, strategy to avoid shortages of materials in, in a warlike situation. And I think in Europe, we now slowly start to think about that war actually is not as far away as we thought. But then, of course, the, the, the overall t topic is that the circular economy is part of a intelligent, decentralized economy or society. And decentralization is a mega trend that many people uh, ignore at the moment. But if you think about 3D print uh, robots that can produce the same thing anywhere in the world, um, the micro, anything micro credit, micro brewery, the crowd finance crowd, all these things are completely decentralized, as is repairs and remanufacture. And so the the, the big thing, the big channel, uh, future mega trend, I think, is an intelligently decentralized world, which means we will abandon globalization and we will start to do everything in in the region or the, the nation. It's called reshoring, uh, for example. America is very con consciously reshoring all their industries because they have realized that with the, the problem with, with the ship shipping when Shanghai Harbor closed down and the Suez Canal closed down and suddenly the, oh, the just in time manufacturing didn't work anymore because you couldn't get the, there are still cars that are unsold. I won't tell you in which country because there is one microchip missing. They cannot sell the microchip as long as they don't, the car. Be, so we, the, this is, we have to decomplexify the whole industrial system 
and come back to simpler structures that may be a bit more expensive. I'm not even sure they may be more labor intensive, but much less capital intensive. And uh, you, you reduce the transport cost, the transport risks and all this. I'm not even sure that it would be more expensive. It would certainly be more resilient and therefore more competitive in the long term. Caroline? Um, we went from talking about uh, paper um, um, whatever the English word is, uh, <laughs> Draw. <Cups. laughs> straws, Sports. yeah, and cups, uh, to actually a very kind of long-term perspective, uh, where um, perhaps uh, this, in some ways, also is, um, as you said, uh, anti-globalization as a consequence of a much uh, more unstable world, perhaps. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, uh, you know, what uh, regulators like and what they do is uh, some sort of a central control or at least a national economy. So how does this work? And uh, the second is, uh, Caroline, for your students, are there points that um, Walter was just talking about that you think they should think about long term? So, you know, if somebody there is talking about, let's say they work for a shipping company and shipping has their own interpretation of, you know, what does environmental work mean to them? But there are very important strategic consequences for shipping of what Walter just said. You know, so so how, how can you encourage them to think both short term and long term in, in, in relation to this? Well, I think it's important to have like, knowledge it's easy to talk about circular economy and everybody should repair and uh, reduce their consumption but actually go into the products and see what's actually what's possible to recycle like we've been talking about plastic and stuff it's not just collecting plastic and recycle it it's uh, too complex and we have to kind of know the product better uh, and i think it's also important or very relevant or interesting uh, with the war situation how we see that things have to be more uh, local but we should not forget the thinking globally as well um you have to do that and i also think it's really uh, interesting everything what you said is interesting but the china uh, issue china uh, it's a country where the government can make decision and it uh, goes on whereas in norway people politicians make a decision and people don't like it and the next year we get the new um government or the, the new politicians that make different decisions so we don't have this long-term perspective which is crucial for sustainability and circular economy final thing Maybe we'll we'll, or we'll, uh, we'll finish in not too long. So I just want to say, I really like your the um, what we the need for a vision that we can think uh, locally and uh, like on our own behavior. But we have to have a long term vision in order to make changes. And what's kind of been positive with the corona, if you can say something positive about that, is that we actually managed saw that we can do things in the short term. Uh, when there is a big problem, we kind of uh, uh, things happen and we see that with the less and more expo uh, expensive metals and resources, we manage to do make things more efficient and find replacements. But we have to have this vision, thinking long term, that uh, things actually can change and more uh, efficiently than that we can think about now. Yes, the the trick is really we have we need a more resilient society. So if something like the war in Ukraine or Corona COVID happens, it should not completely throw us uh, off off the track. And uh, I think that is definitely the lesson that uh, many countries have learned from from the last few years that. Uh, we completely dependent on we were dependent even face masks from china as as if we would not be capable of producing face masks in europe and things like this so the i think the, the last two years three years have been a very good learning exercise now the question is is our politicians really drawing the conclusions or as soon as the problem is over they fall back into the old 
uh, manufacturing paradigm? That is the big, mm. the big uh, question. I think that's a very important uh, lesson, both for <laughs> circular economy and, uh, but in general for societies. I have a feeling that we are tired and we just want to go back to the world as it was, but it won't. <laughs> <laughs> so, Caroline. Um, then my last question to both of you is, uh, I think also your point about, you know, we need knowledge. We can't just be waving our hands in a circular motion and talk about mm -hmm. all things circular, but the sort of, you know, examples and uh, numbers that uh, Walter has, that you have, you know, where can students go to, to learn uh, relevant facts? Oh, I... I think it's uh, all out there. It's just like to to study, to find, and to maybe also zoom in on specific products and uh, uh, and resources, like uh, to to uh, take it apart and see what's uh, replaceable and how what can be recycled. Like you said with Ford, that they found what lasted for the longest time and uh, remove that. Maybe we should think the other way around, find out what lasts for the shortest time and how we can extend the life or to, uh, replace the product. But um, we have to think big, but we also have to think uh, uh, narrow when it comes to, for instance, products like plastic. What is really plastic? It's not just plastic it's a uh, lot of different parts of it and some can we do some works for some products for uh, use for instance for uh, making food last for ever uh, for a longer time whereas other types of plastic is uh, cannot be recycled and and is less efficient so yeah digging into more specific not just uh, uh, we have to have visions, but not uh, not just think recycle, but think uh, also, okay, how can we do it on a more product base basis? And you, Walter, other than reading your Bible? <laughs> yeah, you have uh, to do that too. <laughs> I would recommend any student to do a, pra a practice, a practical time in any company. You have Grundfos in Denmark, you have... Uh, Svenska Kugellagerfabrik in Sweden. You have, you have certainly Norway uh, shipping mm. companies. Be, because just by you have to understand how today's economy works, in order then to compare this to your vision of sustainability circular economy, mm. and then you will see what the missing links are, where mm. you can innovate uh, that mm. is beneficial to the company as well as the society and sustainability. But you have to get out in the field, what in management is called managed by management by walking. Mm. I worked at some point for DuPont as a consultant and the CEO of DuPont spends three weeks a month uh, walking around factories, just mm. talking to people, looking at things and saying, why are you doing this like this? Mm. Uh, and so the, the students, the textbooks are very important. Uh, the, everything is important. Mm. But actually seeing life, how it's mm. done, you suddenly realize what, what could mm. be done better, different. Then, of course, mm. convincing somebody to change, that's another question. But at least you have learned your lesson. Mm. Mm. So I heard you say dig in and I heard you say get out. So <laughs> we'll do both. Thank you so much, both of you, for a really, really interesting and uh, educational chat. Thank you both Thank very you. much. It's been a pleasure. Tack för att du lärt dig Learn. Husk att du må registrera dig på learn.tech för att få personaliserade lärningstider, certifikater och mycket mer.